Hi everyone, good morning. We'll just uh, give uh, one more minute for people to join. I, I think we've got um, a lot of people already joined, so let's start. Uh, I think we've got a very uh, short session just for one hour and we have to cover a lot. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, my name is Nirav Shah and I work in our financial reporting advisory services team at uh, Grand Thornton UAE. Uh, prior to joining Grand Thornton uh, UAE, I used to work in London for more than 10 years at Deloitte and KPMG uh, in finance, change and technical accounting. Um, at Grand Thought in UAE, we provide technical and accounting advisory services across uh, various industries in UAE. Um, Grand Thought is also doing a lot of work uh, around uh, risk uh, model development and validation across uh, different countries, including UAE. Uh, we have a center of excellence team uh, comprising of subject matter experts uh, who have executed over uh, 50 risk uh, model development and validation engagements. Uh, this is across uh, global financial services uh, clients. Um, we have with us uh, Jatin, who also works in our uh, center of excellence team for global and UA clients. Uh, he will take us through most of uh, the session today. Um, just uh, one more point before I hand over to Jatin. Uh, we have a Q&A session uh, in the end uh, for uh, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so meanwhile, if you have any question, please submit them uh, in the Q&A section uh, available, and we will discuss that uh, at the end of the webinar. Thank you. I'll hand over now to Jatin. Thanks, Nirav. Um, good morning, everyone. So like Nirav mentioned, we have a power packed session for the hour that we have. Um, We're going to talk about ECL model validation. Uh, of course, model validation can cut across different types of models, uh, but we'll keep it focused here on expected credit loss models, uh, which uh, you all may be making as per IFRS 9. Uh, the whole objective of us keeping the session at this time was of course where we are from a, a life cycle perspective, model life cycle perspective. Um, everyone of course developed their IFRS 9 ECL models uh, four or five years back. And then since then, uh, there has been a continuous uh, upgrade which has been happening. People have been evolving their ECL models. They are uh, you know, regularly looking for which are those areas to improve, which are the global best practices which can be incorporated and you know, now one can say that the ECL models are at a much more mature level. Things have developed and things have become good. And then of course, with some of the CBOA guidelines and regulations which have come in, uh, the other aspects of managing models have, have been brought into spotlight. Uh, this includes of course, model monitoring and model validation. Uh, with uh, MMS and MMG getting effective very soon, uh, the validation related requirements of it, uh, it of course becomes, you know, uh, quite a important time for us to really see what the best practices and uh, what the current themes around ECL model validation is. And accordingly, we scheduled it and we hope that it is going to be a useful session for you. So we'll start off, like Nira mentioned, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, we have tried to keep uh, keep some time for uh, you know us to answer the questions that come in. All right, so independent model validation. Let's let's understand what it contains, right? Um, so uh, what we're talking about here, of course, is um, a requirement to have a team, a specialist, someone validate the models, and that team be independent of the model development team. 
Um, so it's it's you know another check that's incorporated to make sure that the models are effective and to ensure independence of it, to ensure objectivity and free from bias. Um, the requirement from the regulator is that the validation should be done by someone. It can be someone within the bank or it can be someone outside the bank, but whoever does it needs to be independent of the team which created the models, developed the models. Um, this, of course, comes from the MMS and MMG, uh, which was issued uh, late 2022. And as people are currently in the process of cause gap uh, remediations and bringing the models, you know, uh, to the level of requirements of MMS and MMG, uh, validation is going to be the natural next step to ensure that, you know, it's, it's happening in line with uh, objectives. Um, the, the standards also provide uh, frequency of model validation. Um, there's, of course, tiering uh, which is created. You have tier one and tier two. Tier one models are the more critical models. Tier two are relatively less critical. Um, every bank has to identify whether a particular model for them is tier one more critical or tier two, which is relatively less so. Um, you know, in, in our experience and uh, general common sense would, of course, also suggest that a lot of these ECL models would generally be tier one models, uh, considering their impact, considering the uh, pervasive nature of it for and the criticality of it for a bank's operations. So it's it's quite likely that, you know, you would have categorized your ECL models in tier one. What that means is, um, you know, specifically certain kind of models would need a validation once every two years, while others would need it once every three years. These are, uh, you know, the the minimum frequency in the sense that once every two and three years is like the minimum frequency. Um, some banks, of course, have a practice of doing an annual validation. They they have had it since before MMS also came into being. And for them, of course, they can continue with annual validation exercise. Um, it's for uh, it's, it's like a minimum uh, stipulation which is given now. When we talk about ECL models, of course, as everyone would probably know, you will have uh, PD, LGT and EAD models which you'll focus on. Uh, but overall, from an ECL perspective, there are other aspects also uh, which affect these ECL models, things like staging criteria, default definition, segmentation, a lot of these other things as well. And as we talk through the slides, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how validation needs to be done on these other additional areas as well. So moving on, um, evolution of regulatory requirements. Uh, US was the first one. Uh, the Fed in the US brought out, um, you know, the first model management standards all the way back in 2011. Since then, uh, you know, Europe, Canada, UK uh, have brought in some requirements. And of course, UAE, uh, you know, we have the model management standards and the guidance, um, which, which came out in December 22. Uh, in the UK also recently, then, you know, we have had uh, regulations. Uh, so it's, it's something which, you know, big financial services hubs across the globe. And of course, UAE intends to be uh, among the top most hubs for financial services. In all of those places, you're seeing more and more focus on model management and model validation is, of course, a key part of that. Moving on, uh, where does validation fit in in a model life cycle? Uh, typically, what you have is model development, model implementation, model usage, validation, and model monitoring. Now, validation is not something that it, it needs to be done only at a particular time, uh, point in time, uh, like post-implementation only or pre-implementation only. Uh, you would have validation possibly being done before a model is put to use. Uh, after it's developed, you would put it through an independent validation process before you implement it, or it can be that you have a model in place and now you would regularly want to keep validating it, uh, you know, uh, just to make sure the objectives are being met. Uh, it's different from model monitoring. Model monitoring is a lot more frequent. It's a lot less comprehensive also, one can say. And of course, it need not be necessarily as independent as a model uh, validation process needs to be. So validation, a lot more formal, a lot more comprehensive, formal report, formal, um, you know, requirements in terms of how do you do it? Well, monitoring you can consider something which is uh, 
uh, you know, something which banks can independently define, you know, what it is that they would want to consider in in monitoring uh, based on their, you know, governance controls and other requirements that they would want to have. Uh, there are some things which you do in monitoring which would be done again in validation. So they are overlaps, but the objectives, like I explained, can be differentiated in the manner I said. Okay, so model validation framework. Um, now, you know, we have tried to simply put what happens in the whole validation journey. Uh, the first thing a validator would need to do is define the scope of validation, which are models you're covering, um, you know, and how you'll be doing it. Um, the scope, the limits, uh, and the uh, methodology of validation you would define. So that's the scoping uh, phase. Then you will start with a policy and documentation review. Uh, then you move forward to data quality checks. Very important, of course, ensuring that the data points which are being picked up, be it internal or external, um, you know, are appropriate, reasonable. Uh, then you'll move on to evaluation. Evaluation can be split in two parts. One is a qualitative evaluation. Second is a quantitative evaluation. In the slides that follow, we're going to talk uh, a lot more about which are those uh, things qualitatively that should be checked and similarly quantitatively, how do you look at it? So that's the core of the validation exercise. But then you move forward, you look at the model assumptions and limitation, reasonableness of that, uh, of that and whether they are unbiased. And then finally, you create a validation report. Um, there's best practice in terms of what should be contained in a validation report. We'll talk about that as well. And then finally, you have discussions with stakeholders and model oversight committee um, it's a requirement of uh, CBUA to have that discussion with the model oversight committee uh, for determining what the further actions should be. That's a typical life cycle. Generally, you can expect a model validation. I mean, it depends on the complexity of the model, but it can take anything from three weeks to three months. Um, the whole exercise, it depends on, on the number of models and everything, but you can expect that amount of time for it to take. Okay, so now let's go into some of these um, individual sections that you consider in a model validation exercise. We're going to start with data quality and suitability check. Now, when you're talking about data quality, it's of course quite important. Um, I mean, you can have very good models, but if the data which is uh, which you're feeding in the model has some outliers, which is distorting the picture, or um, you know has certain missing values because of which again um, you know it's, it's not really appropriate the data has all of these kind of issues then the model is not going to give you the right results so it's, it's kind of like garbage in garbage out regardless of what the models would be so before you get into the models you really look at quality suitability reasonableness of the data uh, you check it quantitatively you check for existence of outliers. Uh, there are certain techniques like histogram or IQR, interquartile range, which you can create uh, to graphically also identify how much outliers is there. Um, once you identify the outliers, um, it would be, of course, a decision to be taken on whether to treat them. Um, you can you know, consider if you want to uh, floor them or cap them, for example. You can consider if you want to use a proxy for some of the outliers, depending on, of course, your understanding of why outliers have, have come in the data, you would want to suitably treat it. So the validation exercise, of course, would be to you know, check for the suitability of whatever treatment is done, whether treatment is done in all places where it should have been done, and therefore it's, it's quite comprehensive, um, and all of the variables and data points is something you would want to take through uh, this test. Um, then missing values, again, similar thing that you'll want to do here. Check for stationarity. Uh, you know, is there any trend? Uh, is there any uh, autocorrelation in the data? If so, then of course, uh, does it have an impact on uh, on the model? And if so, then of course, how do you transform and make sure that uh, it's not distorting the picture? So all of that data transformation techniques, which is done, you would want to qualitatively check for the reasonableness of it. Now, a lot of banks, a lot of organizations might have some external ECL benchmarks also. I mean, for macroeconomic uh, variables and forecast, of course, you'll have external uh, you know, information. 
but sometimes of course because of low default portfolios or because of new uh, products or changes that you would have done it might be needed that you create some external proxies and benchmarks and then use that for your purpose so whenever that's happening whenever you have uh, external ecl benchmarks what is it that a validator should be looking for uh, first of course understanding the portfolio characteristics identifying whether there was a need for external ecl benchmark that needs to be very well substantiated uh, you know a regulator auditor anyone who comes in would first of all expect internal data to have been used explored to the fullest and only in case um, you know it's not sufficient then you supplement it with external data so looking at your portfolio characteristics and um, the data which is available you would want to substantiate whether the use of external data was required and then of course you look at the relevance of the external data vis-a-vis -vis the portfolio uh, which the bank has you would want to see if you have done benchmarking with the peers whether the peers were identified appropriately now to give you an example we are doing a validation exercise and uh, the bank's particular portfolio for which it wanted a proxy through benchmarking uh, was uh, you know of a very niche kind of a product but the benchmark which they created was of a much larger uh, you know of banks which had much more diversified and you know different different nature of uh, products in that sense so trying to see if it's possible to really adjust from there to something which is more relevant for you uh, is something which becomes important when you're doing benchmarking um you would also want to do back testing um now of course it may be a new product so you don't have let's say five years of data or you know a long period of data in which case uh, you would want to use external proxies or benchmarks but then for whatever limited period that you do have the data uh, it's always good to do back testing do some statistical uh, quantification of correlations um, just to make sure that you know it is consistent um, so yeah, uh, you know, when you have external ECL benchmarks, there's a lot more judgment involved in terms of how do you do all of these things, uh, but they are, you know, definitely quite critical. Um, a validator would also check for what historical period is selected. Now, you know, generally you would want to have one economic cycle. Uh, what is one economic cycle? It's very hard to really define. It might be, you know, four years, five years, eight years. It depends really. It does not remain stable always. Um, but of course, what CBUA says is that for corporate wholesale, they would expect to have at least five years of data and for retail, it can be less than that also. But really, you know, you would want to consider that uh, one economic cycle is covered. And uh, what that means is that you would want to cover at least one of the uh, recent uh, downturn periods, like, for example, the 2008 financial crisis or the economic slowdown, which happened in 2015-16. Um, because of the oil price, uh, you know, decline or the COVID-19 crisis, of course. So at least have one of them in the data which you have covered for the modeling purpose. Uh, make sure you have reasonable number of default events. Uh, and uh, very importantly, the data which is used for PD and LGD. So, for example, if PD has 100 defaults, then your LGD model should start with 100 defaults. So they should have consistent data. They should have consistent period also. Uh, so that you know there's uh, coherence in terms of the ultimate result you get after doing a product of PD and LGD. Uh, so that's a check which validator would uh, generally want to do. And then of course, in case there's some changes which have happened in underwriting practices, in your rating uh, methodology, you know, some kind of a regime change which has happened internally, then uh, what kind of adjustments might be needed uh, you know, do you want to uh, remove certain historical period? Do you want to suitably adjust that period? What is it that should be the right thing to do? Uh, you know, in, in such an event would become an important consideration. That's on data quality and uh, suitability. Okay, I do see um, some questions, I mean, quite a lot of questions which have already come in, but we will take them uh, towards the end. <clears throat> okay, moving forward, SICA, which is your significant increase in credit risk and the staging criteria. Very important for ECL, of course. Uh, people who have, you know, have come from the quant background uh, sometimes 
underestimate the importance of these things. Uh, but from overall ECL IFRS 9 compliance perspective, uh, you know, these are fundamental design elements and uh, definitely going to be in focus for, from a validation perspective. Few of the tests which we usually do, we have mentioned those examples here. Uh, one, you would want to look at the stability of accounts in stage two. Um, so the proportion of accounts in stage two over a period, whether it's stable and if it's not stable, what the reasons for that is, um, you know, and whether uh, there's a requirement for you to have in more criteria indicators for stage two or, uh, you know, do you see it to be, um, you know, acting appropriately? Um, sensitivity analysis, a lot of banks in the UAE, of course, have, um, uh, uh, you know, have created sicker criteria, which is like if your PD is increasing by, let's say, 100 percent, then you move it to stage two. Or if it, your PD goes beyond a particular level, then you move it to stage two, right? So how much increase in PD would result in a stage downgrade might be one of the criteria which you keep. Um, a test which uh, a validator generally would perform is that um, a sensitivity check on it, right? So let's say you have 100% increase in PD is a stage downgrade. What if you had 80% or 120% instead, right? A little bit of change in that criteria, if you do that, what happens? If that means that, uh, uh, you know, earlier, let's say I had uh, X number of accounts which were moving to stage two in my original criteria. And when once I do sensitivity check, um, a lot more or a lot less loans are moving to stage two. So it's not really stable. It's very, very sensitive to a small change. Then, you know, it creates a question on whether the threshold is fine, right? Uh, so one would want to do a little bit of sensitivity check, see what the results there are, and then consider whether, you know, uh, is it that we have kept the threshold too low or too high, and whether it's, you know, working for the purpose that we want it to be, like whether it's significant enough increase it or not. Um, next thing, of course, you may have low credit risk criteria, which is to say that all low credit risk customers are stage one. Um, you would want to see historically how they have performed. Um, you would, you know, you would expect very less customers who have moved from low credit risk to default to stage three. So a historical check on that can help you substantiate your low credit risk criteria. Uh, there's there's quite common industry practice at the moment on what low credit risk is. Um, so generally, you know, it's it's not a big point of contention. Uh, but yes, you know, one would expect uh, a check like this to, to be performed there. Then uh, the roll forward, roll back rate. What that means is how many uh, from stage one roll forward to stage two, how many roll forward from stage two to three, and then roll back from three to two, roll back from two to one. So that roll forward, roll back rates, you would want to compute it and you would want to see whether they are intuitive, they are stable, they are explainable, right? Whether they are making sense or not that computation and that assessment comes into picture. If you have a repertable presumption, generally you would that anything which is 30 days past you is stage two. If you have done that, uh, a very important consideration is whether that is enough, right? So this repertable presumption of 30 DPT and 90 DPT, they're supposed to be like backstop indicators. They're supposed to be the last, uh, you know, the last place at which uh, loans needs to get identified as having sicker and uh, not really the, the you know, you should have more qualitative or more uh, leading indicators which can help identify uh, stress in the portfolio a bit more promptly. So you would want to see that, uh, you know, how much are the loans which are moving to stage two because of 30 DPD, how much are moving to stage two because of other criteria and whether the proportions are in line with what you generally expect to see uh, for that kind of portfolio industry. Now for wholesale, you would expect that a lot more loans would move, in, move into stage two because of other criteria as opposed to because of uh, 30 DPD, while for retail, most of the loans move to stage two because of 30 DPD. So you have to really uh, assess in light of the nature of portfolio you're testing and then uh, identify if it's making sense. And then finally, uh, curing period. Um, people might have a curing period of 12 months. Um, so generally for six months, 12 months, maybe, uh, you know, people are keeping as a curing period. A lot many in UA, of course, have 12 months. 
Now the question that that would come in there is, uh, is that appropriate? Um, you would want to validate using some, um, you know, uh, samples. You would want to uh, test uh, those assumptions. You would want to, for example, calculate the re-default rates uh, after curing and whether that re-default rates is in sync with the original default rate of the bucket uh, that it cures into. So that sensitivity analysis, the check of free default rate becomes useful. OK, so that was, uh, you know, what you would say the design elements of, uh, of, you know, a validation exercise for ECL. Uh, now we'll move to the core aspects, the PD, LGD and the EAD models. Um, you know, we do have limited time, so we may not be able to go into details of each and every test, uh, but we like to give you uh, some perspectives of practically how it's done and also show you an example, which hopefully uh, illustrates some of the test and how do you interpret those results? So, so we hope that it's going to be useful for you in that sense. Let's talk about PD first. PD, uh, we have here qualitative validation and quantitative validation. Qualitative validation is more where uh, judgment and expertise of the validator comes into picture. Um, he would want to look at the facts. He would want to look at um, any changes, situations which have happened to make an assessment of whether all of it is reasonable. And quantitative is very much statistical. You know, they would run a series of different tests for different properties and then identify if the results are in range or not. So from a qualitative perspective, some of, again, it could be a laundry list of a lot of different things. We mentioned some of the most common ones that we, we apply. Uh, the first one is granularity of segmentation used for PD modeling. On what basis you have done segmentation, whether it's reasonable, whether it's consistent with uh, the understanding of the portfolio characteristics, uh, the differentiation in credit risk. So that qualitative assessment of segmentation is extremely critical, especially for retail based products. Uh, for wholesale, you would expect ratings to be the basis, but for retail segmentation, um, you know, qualitatively, whether it's making sense or not is an important point. Uh, then you would want to see the lending standards, the underwriting and, you know, the risk score scoring or uh, the risk rating methodology of your organization, whether it has been consistent over time or not. If it has changed, then your PD, uh, you know, would also reflect that change. So, for example, his, uh, you know, earlier you had very uh, lenient credit underwriting policies, which meant that there were a lot of high risk customers also who you gave out loans to. Now you have restricted it. So now the type of customers are much better. So if you compare historical data with the more recent data, you would not see that to be comparable, right? And unless you adjust for that fact in your modeling exercise, the results would not be appropriate. So um, identifying if there are any situations like these and how they have been treated uh, would be an important test to be done. Uh, consistent application of curing period in the model, uh, time series, portfolio segmentation. So quite a few things. There's a lot of comparison that people do from a variance calculation perspective also, and then critically assess whether the variances are reasonable. Uh, we have given examples of these here. Uh, so for example, one year default rate, observed default rate, uh, compare it with one year uh, predicted uh, probability of default, right? So comparison of observed default versus predicted default one year through the cycle one, just to identify if you know it's appropriate. Uh, similarly, point in time one year default rate versus point in time one year probability of default comparison of them, and there could be similar other comparisons, uh, you know, of the cumulative default rate of, um, you know, uh, you can do marginal default rate also to identify if it's uh, reasonable the results. These are all important uh, qualitative variance analysis that you would do. But then let's move to quantitative validation. And here uh, from a PD perspective, there are three tests which are generally uh, done. One is to identify the discriminative power of the model. If you have, for example, risk scores or risk ratings, um, you know, you would want to see how good are those models in terms of uh, 
identifying good customers from bad customers. Now, mostly bad customers should be in the lower rating. Good customers should be in the higher rating. Uh, so some of these tests which we have mentioned here can help you identify how good your models are in discriminating good and bad customers. So there are a few of these tests. We'll open an Excel and show some of these to you. Uh, the second is calibration accuracy of the model. So this is what you typically call as, uh, you know, back testing or accuracy uh, ratio calculations. You will see what the observed default rates uh, have been versus what the predictions were. So prediction versus observed default rates and identify whether, you know, uh, the models have been accurate or not accurate, um, you know, within a reasonable range or not. And then uh, to identify the population of models. So if you have multiple segments or multiple rating categories or whatever, um, and you're using it for, you know, for your uh, PD calculations, then you would want to see whether the population spread across them, is it stable or not? If it's changing a lot, then probably there's, there's some issue you would have to deal with. Maybe it's an underlying change uh, in the regime, like the underwriting or uh, you know policies that you have like that, or maybe it's just that the model is not really good in terms of prediction. Um, there are too much uh, you know inaccuracies which are coming in. So population stability, uh, PSI index, uh, PSI test is something which is quite common here. Let me try to see if I can show some of these to you in an Excel file also. Yeah. So, you know, just created a quick uh, summary of some of these tests uh, that we do. So there are eight tests mentioned here. Like you would see, uh, you know, you have some tests which are for discriminatory power, for segmentation, for accuracy, and for population stability. The tests are mentioned here. The description of test would be mentioned here. And then you will also mention the criteria, whether it's acceptable or not. So the first one, for example, if you see, we're talking about the cumulative accuracy profile um, in this what you will see is that okay you know historically you've had uh, you know uh, these score bands score 300 to 1000 these are the credit score bands that you've had and uh, you know how many bad customers have come from each of these score bands so in score band one uh, you have two bad customers in the next one you have 15 and so on so what has been the percentage of bad customers Basis that you identify what your, uh, you know, what your uh, uh, like uh, discriminative power has been, what your CAP has been. And obviously, the higher uh, it goes, the better it is. In this particular case, we had 62%. Uh, generally, anything more than 50% is considered to be acceptable range. Um, so if we have a test like this, you calculate uh, the ratio and you get 62%, you would generally accept that to be. Uh, a reasonable thing. Uh, obviously perfect, like in this graph, you can see the black line is the perfect line, uh, which would give you a score of 100%. Uh, while ours is the blue line, which is close to black. Um, as you know, close to black, it could be, uh, that's that's what you want it to be, right? So that's the, uh, you know, uh, cumulative accuracy profile test, which you do. Uh, a very similar test is AUROC. The only difference is, uh, you know, in CAP, you look at the cumulative good and bad customers. In AUROC, you look at the marginal good and bad customers. You can see either of these tests being done. Some validators do one test, some do other tests. Uh, the, the ratio you get is same. Uh, in the earlier one, also you got 62%, here also 62 So they are both the same test, would give the same results. There's just two different ways of approaching it. Then for segmentation, uh, like I mentioned, uh, uh, information value calculation, you know, calculating the weight of evidence, identifying what the information value is, um, is very much recommended. In this case, we see that the IV is like 0 0.45. And from this like interpretation uh, table, we can see that anything beyond 0 0.25, 0 0.3 is generally considered to be strong. Uh, you may accept medium also in some cases, but definitely anything below weak becomes a problem. And sometimes it's statistics, so you can have, uh, you know, some distorted numbers also. We have seen IV go beyond one also, uh, in which case uh, it's, it's probable that 
you know, the IB test may not be usable because of some distortion which is there. So either you adjust for it or you consider doing a different test. So anything beyond 0 0.5 is where you should be doing that kind of an assessment. Uh, so that's for segmentation. Then for accuracy, for calculation of whether the predictions of PD, uh, whether they have been in acceptable range or not, the most common test is the binomial test. Um, we'll give you an example of it. Uh, you have a two tail and a one tail test. In a two tail test, you look at what the actual default rates were. In this case, you'll see actual default rates to be like this. You look at what the predicted PDs were, which are here. So then running the test, uh, you calculate what the upper and lower bounds would be. So for the current bucket, uh, you know, acceptable range is 0 0.63 to 1.43. And the actual defaults, of course, has been 0 0.97, which is very much within the range. So you would pass. Uh, but in our example, what we see is that 60 to 90 DPD bucket, uh, the default rates have been much higher than predicted default rates and uh, it's beyond the range also. So this is something which would fail the test and you would have to assess the implications of this. Um, so this is a two tail test. Um, you know, sometimes some people, you know, it's, it's, it's something which people do that uh, they apply a one tail test, uh, you know, by considering the confidence levels. Typically 95% confidence um, is, is quite commonly used to be used 99 also though. And you'll see whether uh, you know, uh, if it goes below, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, you like in this case, you simply look at what the upper bound was and whether it's, uh, you know, your upper bound is below uh, what your actual default rates have been. So um, in that case, it's a one tail test, but essentially a test is exactly the same. Here you look at both the lower bound, upper bound, and here you look at just the upper bound to do the assessment. Um, so if you are just testing whether your ECL is uh, should not be understated, then you can do a one tail test. But if you're looking at whether ECL can be both understated or overstated, then you would do a two tail test. Recommendation of course is of two tail, uh, but from an audit perspective, sometimes one tail is enough. Then um, you know there are certain other tests which which are given for doing the accuracy ratio calculations. Um, MAP, again, you look at actual defaults versus predicted defaults, whether they are in the range. MAP acceptable range, you know, less than 15% is really good. Less than 25% is possibly acceptable. Above 25% is where you fail. Here, the MAP is 33% for the same bucket, which is a problem one, so it fails. Um, but then there are other tests. Uh, so if I talk about the HL test, this one is quite smart in the sense that it doesn't do calculation of range at an individual bucket level. It does it at an overall portfolio level. And as you can see at an overall portfolio level, this over this portfolio does pass both at 95% confidence and 99% confidence uh, levels. Um, so for someone who is facing this kind of a problem where one stage is failing but generally the portfolio you know the model is good for all the other portfolios uh, something like hl test ends up you know doing it at a overall portfolio level as opposed to the stage bucket levels uh, so this is something which you know sometimes is a good tool uh, to understand and know and then of course we have the population stability index we look at whether the population has been stable across the period uh, you may have uh, you know uh, uh, two samples for example which you're comparing um, and see whether it's stable across the development and uh, the validation samples uh, anything beyond 0 0.1 is where you start to worry in this case the population stability index is only 0 0.02 so definitely very much in acceptable range so again this again you know it's not necessarily a very deep dive into each of these tests, but more of an overview just to give perspectives of how a quantitative assessment of something like PD would happen, what kind of test you would do, how you would interpret it and so on. I'll move to um, my slides again. <clears throat> okay, so coming to LGT, 
Uh, now, LGD also works in a similar manner. You do qualitative and quantitative validation. The type of tests which you do are somewhat uh, different. Uh, you know, you would you would generally want to do a Spearman rank uh, correlation. Um, this statistic would help you identify. You know, you would do calculation at each individual default loan level, and this calculation would help you identify if overall your predicted LGD is uh, you know uh, reasonable, whether your actual LGDs are within a reasonable range of your predicted LGD or not. But there are some other tests also which we mentioned here. Um, couple of different things from an LGD perspective uh, to really focus on. Uh, one is the observation period which you consider. Now, uh, the defaults which go for LGD model is something which has to be critically evaluated. You would not want to take defaults, right, which have not had a uh, you know reasonable enough period of recovery into your LGD model. So to give you an example, let's say a loan defaulted just one month back. Uh, now, of course, in this last month, which I know, let's say the recoveries have been zero. If I take this loan in the LGD model, it would say, OK, there has been a loan with zero percent recovery, but that may not be right because the loan may give you more recoveries in the future. So how much time do you wait before a defaulted loan should be taken to the LGD model becomes very important. So from a qualitative perspective, that becomes a critical judgment which the validator would uh, want to assess. So that's one thing which uh, is LGD specific, quite important in that sense. Um, you would obviously want to identify if you have done segmentation for LGD appropriately or not. There might be different channels for recovery. Uh, you know, you might do a sale, you might do a recovery from the customer, or there could be different things which may happen. Um, one would want to see what those different channels could be, which loans have which probability of going into different channels, and accordingly, the LGD model could be more, uh, you know, could help help in better predictions of that. So that, and of course, you would want to see what interest rate use you you have used, what kind of cost of recoveries you've captured, all of those things. That's for LGD. Um, I do have an Excel for this also, just to illustrate some of the tests. Like I mentioned, Spearman rank correlation. We have performed that here. Uh, the rank higher it is, better. Uh, we're getting a rank of 0 0.88, which is quite reasonable. That's one test which is performed here. Um, then, of course, you would do MED test also to identify what the deviations are between the predicted and the observed LGD. You would do that for all the defaulted accounts, see what the you know average deviations have been. Um, in this case, the deviations have been around 0. Point, sorry, 9%, uh, which is again, you know, uh, probably uh, would probably be considered as acceptable by the validator. And the last test could be very useful. Uh, you identify what the expected loss shortfall has been. In this case, what we see is that it is negative 7%. And if you look at the interpretations, it would say uh, that a negative number would mean that there is an overestimation of LGD. Uh, so your LGD was a bit overestimated in comparison to what your expected recoveries have been. So you may want to do an overlay on an adjustment to uh, to you know do this. Uh, so expected loss shortfall from that sense. Moving forward, uh, EAD. EAD, the different aspects are more around prepayment modeling. Uh, they're more around identifying behavioral maturity and you know um, what kind of uh, interest assumptions that you have taken. So that's from that perspective. And quantitative validation is more from a CCF uh, you know, credit conversion factor perspective. Uh, the tests are quite similar. You would see the MAD test here also. Um, you would see the Spearman rank correlation here also. And again, on all the defaulted accounts, uh, we would want to consider whether CCF has been reasonable, predicted versus actual, and whether the test results demonstrate statistical uh, reasonableness of it. That's on EAT. Uh, moving on, the last type of models you have, of course, are macro models. Um, 
you'll do a qualitative review where you look at which variables are considered, whether the variables make qualitative sense, uh, whether it meets, uh, you know, the expectation of, you know, whatever business intuition you have in terms of correlations and all. Uh, you would benchmark it with industry peers. It needs to be ones which industry also agrees with. Otherwise, of course, you would want to be, uh, you know, checking it twice. Uh, benchmark with external sources, the forecast which you've used, all of that. Uh, if you have used lacked variables, you would want to review the justification of it. If you've used any variable transformation techniques, uh, let's say you have not used uh, the actual variables, but you used a z-score of those variables. Let's take an example. So whether it was appropriate to do that or not, qualitatively, you will do all of those assessment. And then quantitatively, primarily, it would be a regression-based model, uh, most likely. So you would look at correlation, you would look at, um, you know, the characteristics of the data, like stationarity, you know, multicollinearity, autocorrelation, things like that. Um, you would look for those assumptions and whether, uh, you know, the data is appropriate to be used in a regression model that you've used. So uh, testing that quantitatively is, you know, what the validator would do. Then moving forward, uh, you'll have model selection and overlays. Uh, there would be different types of portfolios, whether you have used the right model for that. Uh, you know, you can of course have a deterministic model. You can have a regression based statistical models. You can have expert judgment models. You can have proxy models. Um, you may even have, uh, you know, something like a Monte Carlo simulation based model or a AI ML model. So whatever models you have used, whether it makes sense to use those models for the kind of portfolio which you have is uh, what you do here. Um, the scenario weights that you have determined, both statistical and qualitative review of that becomes important. Uh, there are some techniques in which you can statistical, you know, Bayesian and other techniques in which you can review uh, whether uh, the weights you have assigned to different scenarios is, is reasonable. But then it's also very important to do a qualitative review. Look at all the inputs from a market, from a, you know, external experts, regulator, all the inputs you're getting on the direction of economy, direction of movement of certain MEVs, and whether the choice which the company has taken, um, it is appropriate in line with, you know, uh, what the industry expectations are. And then finally, management overlay. Uh, management overlay is going to be an inescapable reality like whatever best models you create, um, you know, you cannot escape the fact that uh, there would be certain risk or certain elements which you would not be able to model and to account for them, you'll have to do a post model adjustment or a management overlay. For this, it's more about, um, you know, whether the management judgment is free from bias, uh, whether it's done at the appropriate level. Now, overlay should not be like, okay, 5% increase in overall ECL. It should be okay. This particular segment, the number of defaults could be higher or lower. So you adjust a PD for that particular segment. Uh, similarly, LGD. So it should be more on a particular segment for a particular reason, which should be uh, reasonable and well documented and should go through a governance uh, channel also, which is set into place. Uh, so as a validator, one would want to check these things. Uh, you know, make sure that these are appropriate. Finally, what do you get as an outcome of all of this, you know, extensive exercise that we do? Uh, the outcome would be a validation report. Uh, the best practices around that is you would want to include details of all the models, uh, its materiality, classification, uh, the key dates. Uh, one thing which is important, of course, is the validator would look at all the model monitoring reports also. So you would want to make reference of the monitoring dates and the results like that. You would have the findings, observations. You would have the risk rating. The ratings are mentioned here. You know, it's it's not something which is prescribed anywhere, but is more like a best practice. Um, you know, it can be anything from okay, leave the model unchanged to uh, you know, redevelop or withdraw the particular model. And then of course, overall conclusion on the performance of these models. Uh, moving ahead, what kind of key challenges are there in the model validation process? Um, data availability, quality, 
is a key challenge. Uh, lack of benchmarking standard definitely is a very significant issue. Model stability, adaptability, uh, model complexity, inter uh, interpretability are uh, some of these challenges which you know validators would usually face. And finally, what are the emerging trends in model validation? Three things we would want to focus on. One is use of emerging technologies and automated solutions. Um, you know, validators, uh, I mean, there's a lot of expectations which have gotten built from model validation now. Um, there's a lot more theory now. There's a lot more uh, best practices which are understood. So it, it becomes, I mean, earlier it used to be that, okay, you know, it's up to the validator what they want to do. But now there's a lot of expectations from that process. So to be able to fulfill it, it becomes important that you have standardized methodology. You know, hopefully you have automated solutions to make sure that all of that extensive work is done effectively, efficiently, and also accurately, right? So automated solutions have become very, uh, very much uh, more popular now for, for the validation exercise. Um, use of emerging technologies like AI, ML models, big data analytics. Uh, it's catching on, uh, but not so much in use for ECL as of now. Uh, possibly in the future, it would become more common, uh, especially for something like LGD, possibly things like that. But currently, people who have made it also, they have considered it to be more like a challenger model as opposed to their primary in production model. And therefore, uh, you know, it's it's very much still emerging as an alternative to uh, the more legacy approaches that we have had. But then uh, the other trend is uh, this only development of challenger models, uh, considering what alternative data sources are there, considering, uh, you know, developing a altogether different model, which you call it as a challenger model and comparing results to provide more insights. Um, so it's not only that, OK, your model is not working correctly here. It's also that, OK, you can do this. And if you do this, this is what happens doing that extra step. And the third trend that we see uh, catching on is uh, providing substantiated evidence for each observation. So if someone is saying this is best practice and therefore this is the gap, uh, helping identify why it is best practice, what evidence is there of suggesting that this is best practice uh, or that is, um, you know, benchmarked uh, best, best practice or whatever, uh, including that in the report along with the suggested remediation that how do you most efficiently move from where you are to uh, where the suggestion is. So these are some of the things which are emerging from model validation exercise perspective, which uh, is, is adding value to the process. OK, so now um, lastly, what I want to do before we move to some of the questions which have come up. Um, we have, of course, done this session to help you get more insights on the whole model validation journey. Uh, we are hoping this was useful for you, but we don't want to leave it at that. Uh, we want to offer, um, you know, an extremely useful tool uh, to friends and clients of Grant Horton as well. And the tool is one of its kind, first of its kind, a ECL model maturity assessment tool. You know, this is an automated solution. We'll give you a trailer and glimpse of it, which you can help to identify, to benchmark your ECL policies, your framework, your methodologies, your assumptions, your judgment. All of these things, you can benchmark these against best practices, against regulator expectation. And you can do it on your own, right? Register on the tool, uh, you know, with the use of uh, you know the questions in the assessment which is there do that and then at the end of all of it you get a dashboard with a lot of results in terms of where it is that the gaps might be there what is it that could be done uh, you know what the level of maturity of different models are all of those benchmarking and everything is something which you get as analytics for your consumption so that's something which we are launching uh, it is in line with uh, IFRS 9 expectations of regulators in the UAE of, uh, you know, the let's say large audit firms or whoever are the key stakeholders for UAE banks perspective. 
So we're doing it. And like I mentioned, it's something which uh, we are offering as a complimentary access as a resource which can be used by UAE banks, um, you know, on their own for, for uh, no consideration in that sense. So with that, I'll show you a quick glimpse of what this tool are to uh, tool is uh, to to make you, uh, you know, uh, for for providing further clarity on it. I'll just share my audio and the video here. Right, so um, that was the trailer of our ECLSS Pro. Um, and now we'll move on to any questions uh, which might yeah, be thanks, there. Thanks, thanks, Jatin. I think we have got a couple of questions. Uh, let's see how many, uh, if we can take more than that. Um, the first question is, uh, do I need to validate the ECL parameters like CCF, LGD, if I'm using the regulatory process? Okay, so if I look at MMS, MMG, the CBUA expectations and requirements, um, the first thing to consider is whether you should be using regulatory proxies also or not. Um, so when we talk about, uh, you know, what's most acceptable and from there on, uh, using on data is the most preferred. Second, of course, would be uh, benchmarking using external data, which is most uh, relatable to your portfolio. And then if nothing else works, you use export judgment, which may make use of uh, proxies, regulatory proxies and stuff like that. Um, whether validation needs to be done if you're using proxy, absolutely yes. Regulatory proxies also, you have to do a formal validation, even if you have an export judgment based model like that. Um, it would of course not have a lot of these quantitative tests, which we may have discussed. Uh, but a qualitative assessment and some kind of, uh, you know, quantitative test for back testing uh, to the extent possible is still something which would be an expectation uh, from the regulator. Yeah, thanks. Um, next question How should I validate PD term structure specifically where there is any change in banks underwriting policies? Okay. Um, so what I understand here is that uh, we have had changes in underwriting policy because of which there's some part of uh, historical data which is not consistent with other part of historical data, right? So uh, let's say there's five years of data. For the first two years, you had some different policies for underwriting and the other three years, you have different policies. Um, so it, it does uh, create challenges. Um, we did speak about it um, you know earlier also that you would want to then consider to what extent is the differentiation to what extent is the impact of that change um, if it is not very significant then you may be able to use the data without any changes if it is a little bit significant but not massive uh, you may consider doing some kind of a scalar some kind of an adjustment so that you can bring them at a more consistent level. But if it is very, very significant, uh, then possibly it is that, you know, you cannot use that period uh, in which your policies were very different. So it really depends the extent of changes and accordingly you, you might be making the choice. 
Thanks. <clears throat> I think we'll take one more last question, uh, which we have. The question is, how should I treat the cases which defaulted during the year but cured within that year while calculating the observed defaults for PD validation? Um, I think it's a simple one in the sense that you have to consider those cases even if they have cured by the end of the observation period. If they did default sometime within that observation period, then it is to be considered as a default from a PD modeling perspective. Thanks. Um, I think we, we, we are, are time uh, already. Yeah, almost there. Yeah. Uh, I hope uh, everyone you found this session uh, useful. Um, of course, if you have any further questions or if you have any requirements uh, around uh, model development and validation, uh, please feel to reach out to us and we'd be happy to you know help uh, and discuss further. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.